Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome back to another episode of MedTech Trends. Uh, I'm your host, Dorian. Uh, so today we have with us a very special guest. Uh, his name is Sam Dubok, and he's joining us from Toronto, I believe, today. And uh, so in 2015, uh, Sam Dubok and his wife, Claire Dubok, joined Dr. Peter uh, Farvolden and Dr. Elena Denisoff uh, to grow their practice and help CBT associates, which are based in Toronto, meet the increasing demand for mental health care and improve patient access across Ontario and Canada. But it quickly became evident that there were quite a few gaps in their system and uh, in the delivery of mental health care. And so they needed to create a solution around this. So they began growing this practice and extending their reach through multiple in-person clinics. Then in 2016, they fundamentally changed their business model by creating MindBeacon as an innovative tech solution that provides evidence-based, accessible mental health care to all Canadians, no matter where they live. Today, MindBeacon is developing a continuum of mental health care that includes therapist guided programs, live therapy sessions, and great information resources like Stronger Minds. As one of the first commercially available digitally native platforms to offer therapist assisted internet based cognitive behavioral therapy in Canada, MindBeacon's professional service is designed around end users, their way, their health. Now, MindBeacon works with employers, insurance carriers, and government ministries. Uh, to uh, increase the accessibility, affordability uh, of mental health uh, services, and particularly the ones, the kind that are proven to be effective. MindBeacon is changing the therapy landscape by making professional healthcare available to every Canadian, no matter when, where, and how they choose to access it. Now, as MindBeacon's leader, Sam's mission is to make mental health care available, affordable, and accessible to all Canadians. By eliminating barriers around mental health, they want to change and improve the lives and minds of people. So welcome uh, to the show, Sam. Thanks so much for taking the time this afternoon to join us. I appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, Dorian. Wonderful. So uh, I wanted to uh, take this time to dive into some of the work that goes into creating very accessible mental health services, uh, again, available to all Canadians. And, and I'm sure um, other folks around the world can, can make use of this sort of thing as well. Um, I wanted to start off with a little bit about your background and how you transition into this space, the mental health care space. Um, and the piece that uh, that I read about as uh, I did my homework for this interview um, is that you were once a, a board member uh, on the Canadian Mental Health Association uh, Foundation. And from that experience, you had probably quite a bit of um, access to uh, and, and information to how the mental health landscape looks like, particularly in Ontario, uh, I would have imagined that that would have made it quite an easy thing to, let's say, if anybody who was close to you, if you yourself needed to seek out mental health services, that would have been readily, access, readily accessible to you. But you came across some some barriers, some boundaries when you did so, uh, seek some help. I, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how how was it that how was that possible? Essentially, how is it the case that 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 could be? Was it a, a barrier in terms of uh, you know, you, you knew where to go, but getting there was still difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think that's it. The the real issue. So I, so I'm a serial entrepreneur, right? I I've been through a bunch of businesses and for profit, not for profit. I've been fortunate enough to work in the government. And one of the things I did was serve on the board of the the Center for Addiction and Mental Health Foundation. It's a wonderful institution. Um, Cam H is a true Canadian treasure for sure. Um, and, and by that way, and just by my nature, I sort of am a bit of a geek. And so I delved into what is mental health care? How does it work? What do you do? What are some effective treatments? What are some effective treatments? So I was very knowledgeable in it. Knowledge was not the issue. The issue was all of the real barriers that you have. You can overcome knowledge on the internet. But the real barriers that Canadians face, I face just like anybody else. There's a shortage of trained mental health care professionals deliver face-to-face -face treatment. It's simply very hard to get. There's stigma associated with it, having to leave your office and, and let the people know you're leaving your office at 2 o'clock to get to an appointment at 2.30 or 3, to spend an hour to come back to your office. There's the issue of cost. It's expensive, right? It's not typically covered by OHIP. It can be in certain cases, and certainly emergency and psychiatry are, but in, in regular therapy, not. It's privately provided for. And, you know, just sort of the whole hassle around talking about it, getting into it and everything else. I face the same barriers and wait lists that everybody else faced, right? So the issue that the advantage I have is I knew what therapy I wanted. 
my brother had been on a depression drug for a while, so I knew what drug actually worked or should work with my genetics. The mental health care drugs tend to react differently with different people's genetics. And there's a study called pharmacogenomics that actually works pretty well on antidepressant drugs and to help you figure out which ones will work, which ones won't, how it metabolizes in your system. Um, so I kind of knew what drug I wanted. I knew what therapy I wanted, but you know, finding the right person, getting the right skill set, making the time out of the schedule, scheduling hassles, travel hassles. And I was fortunate enough to live in a major urban area. For all of your listeners that don't live in major urban areas, there may not be a psychologist. There might not be a social worker that's really trained within miles. There may be long drives to get there. And then of course, because at least, well, not at least, but because like Beacon Beacon is all about equity and inclusion of mental health care. I mean, fundamentally, we are trying to democratize mental health care. You know, then you get into the issues of the far north. You get in the issues in certain communities around our great country that just simply have nothing, have no mental health care. And so, you know, lots of barriers out there. Knowledge is the easy one to overcome because it's accessible to most via the internet. Getting access to the professionals, to the actual content, that's difficult, has been traditionally difficult. You definitely touched on a couple of things that I wanted to expand on in this uh, conversation. I think one of them, one of the surprising things, maybe it's not really surprising. That's not the right way to kind of put it, but it's the, you know, people know if you have a, if you've got a broken arm, people know where to go for that. If you have a, uh, a tummy ache, you know where to go for that. Uh, if you, if you're not feeling well, um, and you're sort of in a, your, your mood's off and you can't be productive and you can't focus, that sort of thing, that those are much less obvious health ailments. And even if you recognize it as such, then it's very difficult to decide where you go and what kind of specialist to even see. I mean, it's one thing, I think most people are familiar with psychologists, psychiatrists, um, but it's it's not evident exactly what they can do to, to help you literally feel better when there's no physical ailment, no obvious physical ailment. Um, part of that, I think, has to do with uh, the education and there have been major campaigns and I think we made some pretty good strides when it comes to educating the public but still a long way to go. And uh, I think there's an interesting transition here in terms of how COVID has accelerated, the, the whole pandemic has accelerated uh, the push towards um, people actually seeking mental health and, and understanding when and how they need to, to seek mental health, mental health services. So there's, a, there's an aspect about Mind Beacon. Um, we'll get into the types of services exactly that are offered and, um, and the, the form that people can actually use to to uh, to get these services, one of the things I wanted to ask you up front is, you know, m mental health can be provided in sort of a formal but also kind of an informal setting. Um, the way that I kind of envision that is through your employer. There are workplace wellness programs. There are ways to, uh, you know, do certain activities or access certain programs through your employer. And then there is also people seeking out mental health privately uh, themselves. Um, in the workplace, in particular, and I know that Mind Beacon um, has partnerships and programs, I believe, with employers. The, the idea of absenteeism and presenteeism is a big, it's a big factor for, for employees. Uh, and employers, of course, want to make sure that their employees are staying as healthy as possible, to be as productive as possible, and to, to make, you know, to, to make the best use out of the time in the workplace. I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit from a mental health perspective. Is there an, you know, what's the bigger impact there? Is it on absenteeism? Is it on presenteeism? And, and what can employers really do? Well, first of all, it's on both. I mean, if you look at, you know, it's the number one cost of disability in Canada is mental health related. It's about 30% of cases and about 70% of dollars spent on, uh, on disability across Canada. There was a study done in the UK that demonstrated that you actually got, you know, the cost of the mental health far, 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 something like 20 times almost outweighed the actual cost of treating it. You look at what happens in presenteeism, lots of studies. There's a great study out by Tufts University in Boston, a meta study done a few years ago that cost of presenteeism could be seven to 10 times as high as the cost of absenteeism, right? You know, and, and we all know it and we've all been there. We've all, we've all gone to work. I mean, you know, d depression, being down, you know, not feeling yourself mentally, emotionally, it's, we're, we're all human. Everyone feels it. Everyone has those days, just like everyone, as you point out, has a cold or a tummy ache or things like that. You know, it's a question of depth and duration of the affliction that really helps define whether or not you're depressed or you're just having a normal down day, which we all have, or a normal level of anxiety, completely normal. 
Um, but when it starts to get impact your work on a regular basis, it starts to get in the way of you functioning, whether it's at home or in the workplace, it starts to actually affect how you view the world and you view things such as joy and others in your family. That's when it becomes a serious thing. And those costs are material. It's estimated that it's caught mental health afflictions cost the Canadian economy $90 billion this year, growing to almost $300 billion here in 20 years. I mean, this, these are, and that's just the economic cost orient, like they're like the family costs, you know, you know, one of the great privileges I would say of being in my role is that people, and, and also from what I did, I mean, I was very open about my own struggle. I was, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm an immigrant to Canada out of the Midwest United States. I'm a, uh, you know, I was taught when I grew up uh, what you talked about, and what you didn't talk about. And that wall held very well. And I was very good at hiding those days until my brother died in 2011. And I talk about it in a letter I wrote when our perspective went public. Uh, and when that wall didn't hold, it didn't hold in a big way. And, you know, one of the great honors I have in my role is I get reached out to all the time. In fact, I had two emails today from people, very well-functioning, high-functioning uh, individuals who just had hit the wall. And, you know, the stories that are out there. So, you know, we, we, we quote economic burdens, 90 billion, 300 billion. What we don't quote is the burden on the family, the burden on the children, the burden on the person, the burden on the partners or spouses. Those burdens are far more material than the economic numbers we quote. Because mental health isn't like, and you point this out, it's, it's hard to put your hands around. It's hard to sort of feel, you know, if you get strep throat, but for a prescription of antibiotics and six or seven days, you know, if my wife got it, Claire got it, I know she's going to be better. Mental health is not that. Mental health is, you know, you do everything you can to help the individual, but it's really hard to get your head around. Therefore, it's, that makes it even more important. That's one of the big barriers it creates, which makes it even more important for people to go and have a place where they can get mental health care, how, when, where they want it. This is very much of a treatment where it's very important to break down the barriers that in a sense, you do you. You do what you need to have happen and have, ex and have access to all of those in an equitable and fair manner that allows you to get the treatment you want when you need it. Because it's also not like strep throat, typically, where it goes away. I can tell you, you know, I work with my stuff all the time. And I go back to my cognitive behavioral therapy skills all the time. And it's something where, you know, I'm more prone to dips than others, perhaps, or whatever, whatever that, whatever that may be but it's something that you work on constantly. And so that's why it's so important to break those barriers down, make it easy for someone to get it when they need it, how they need it and what they need uh, and help in navigating around. And like you mentioned, you're, um, you're a serial entrepreneur. The introduction probably didn't uh, do anywhere near the, the justice that it uh, could have in terms of outlining your uh, your career successes and the kind of things that you've done uh, over the course. Of Actually, it sounded decades. like my mother wrote it. So thank you very much. <laughs> it was very kind of you to say it the way you did. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> Melissa also ha had a hand in that as well. But <laughs> okay. yeah, so it was uh, no, I, I mean it's i i love the, the, the again the work that you're doing now is extremely important and, and just so so important especially nowadays um so again we'll, we'll we'll get into a bit more depth in in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy which is the the primary yep. which that's used by mind beacon um just to kind of finish up on on this idea of the the employer perspective the workplace sort of mental uh, mm -hmm. health uh, view on things you're, you're a serial entrepreneur so you've helped not only have you started a lot of your own companies, but you've also helped a lot of other entrepreneurs and, and maybe you still mentor a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, there's a lot of stress, obviously, that goes into creating, right. a, building a company. Um, and then as an employee, you're obviously facing, you know, constant sort of competition. You're, you're, you know, you've got to meet deadlines and so on and so forth. At some point that goes past just, you know, feeling pressure into potentially, you know, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, and, and uh, a whole host of other things. Um, was that part of the thinking by any chance, or do you kind of incorporate the, the idea of accessibility to mental health services to, you know, every Canadian, um, including uh, entrepreneurs or in particular entrepreneurs who also face very unique challenges? Oh, no doubt. No doubt. 
No doubt. And it's, and it's, you know, we often get the credit or the, or whatever you want to call it. We often get, you know, entrepreneurs face unique challenges and they certainly do. And they feel the pressure every day of making sure their employees wake up to a job and go, go to bed. It's also the employees in all these entrepreneurial companies. I want to make sure we, we shout out to those folks. You know, I get calls from my now we're public. I get a lot fewer, but you know, I get calls from employees regularly saying, you know, I'm thinking about buying a house or a condo or getting married. Like, am I going to have a job in six months? You know, all of the pressures that the entrepreneurs face, which are very real and people take, you know, one thing about entrepreneurs, is they take personal responsibility, maybe for too much, but they take personal responsibility for, for it. All of our employees were feeling it as well. They all knew that we were a startup company, knew that we were funded. They felt it. And so we felt we, we have an obligation as entrepreneurs and an obligation as society to make sure you support the entrepreneurs and you support the companies. And, and the best way to do that is to make early intervention accessible and affordable and available. And why do I say that? You know, if you think about it, you think about people like, you know, they're, maybe they're functioning normally and they start to dip. They're having some bad and they're starting to dip and things like that. If you can allow me to suggest that you're going down and, and when you're feeling worse as opposed to up when you're feeling better. You know, when you start to dip down, okay, the best way to do it is to correct it and move back up. Do it early. Don't wait like I did. I waited till the wall broke. Okay. Listen, bad player, good coach, maybe. But I waited till the wall broke. And it, it's hard. And I see every day people who wait till the wall breaks. And you see the most forward thinking employers in this country, right? You think of, you know, the, the forward thinking point was put on, you know, whether it's government or whether it's individuals or whether it's people like the Royal Bank who make a large number of their programs. Beacon, for example, my beacon is freely accessible to, the, to their large number of their employees. It's people like that that understand that we're going to just we want you, in fact, we want you to utilize, you know, the irony about the business is a lot of people say, well, you know, what if everybody utilizes your program? Like, isn't that expensive? I'm like, bring it all on. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get so everybody utilizes it. Why? Because when anybody is starting to feel down, let's correct it early. That's how you limit, you go back to this issue of lowering the presenteeism cost. And you go back to lowering the absenteeism cost is you make it, you make wellness programs available, you make educational self-help programs available. You make things like cognitive behavioral therapy, like what we do in our self-guided programs available. You make our synchronous programs available. You make, you know, even a lot of companies are making, you know, work at home, stay at home, and things like that more. So we'll get to what COVID has done, uh, available to people. And then you have to educate. You have to then tell them about it. You know, one of the first businesses I started was Air Miles. Okay. And I remember starting Air Miles. I remember how many tens of millions of dollars we spent back in the early 90s on advertising. And I was always surprised about how few people after the year one knew about us. After spending all this money and having the pole signs at Shell and the Safeway class, but it taught me a real lesson early in my career. And that is as much as it's important to put the right programs in place, it's important to make sure that communication is there, that people know them and understand them and, and remember them when they need them. And you see many of Canada's great companies doing that on a day-to-day -day basis, and I applaud them for doing it. They really are in the forefront. You know, when you look at what CAMH has done, you look at what Bell has done. I mean, perhaps one of the greatest single things was, you know, led by George and Tammy Cope's idea, but certainly by the whole entire Bell organization in getting people to talk about it. And it's an important thing they did. And, and, you know, forget all the things that they've done in their lives and everything else. This, for me, perhaps their greatest achievement. I mentioned a lot of important points. Um, and, and I agree. I like a lot of the work that um, uh, Bell, um, Let's Talk uh, campaign and, and a lot of the programs they're doing. Now, on the point of communication, uh, this was something that I, I wanted to, to bring up in this conversation as well. Uh, because if you take a look at the, the Beacon website, um, well, I think one of the first things that kind of popped out to me is that so you, you've you've have it uh, nicely kind of laid out in terms of the the three sort of main programs, if you will, that are offered. Um, it's set up in a very question answer type of format, and uh, and basically for anybody that's interested in, if you're wondering, okay, here's here's another company, okay, they're they're looking to uh, you know expand medical services, okay, 
uh, is this really right for me? Well, if you take a look at the website, you've got a list of questions, uh, pretty much every single one that I could think of that I might have as a, you know, a potential flag in my mind before seeking out mental services, and they're all answered very nicely. Uh, it's well laid out. Um, props to whoever built the website. I think one of the questions I had was, you know, how did you identify these particular questions? Um, and uh, was that was that intentional? Was it designed sort of to break down, you know, misconceptions uh, to, to answer FAQs right up front that a lot of people have? Um, and was that designed to to help people just basically get to that that end line of like, okay, well, I mean, I think I, I know everything I need to know. I just need to try it now. You know, we're real happy if someone comes to our website and looks at those questions and walks away without using us with more clarity. That is a win for us. That's what we're seeking. We're seeking people to have clarity on what they need and what they don't need. Okay. And, and that's important to us. So yeah, it was purposeful, but it was also based on, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people that have come to our website and give us feedback and tell us what they're thinking. It's the, all the, I have to look it up now, but the, you know, close to 100,000 people that have actually created an account on our system to actually start their journey in mental health, right? And so we're trying to be purposeful, but the, the, goal of the, the goal of it is so that when you come to our website and when you, if you're going to get on one of our programs, you know, our, there's a ton of free content on our program. Our Stronger Minds program is free and accessible to all Canadians, videos, helpful thoughts on how you do it, what you can think about, all of that stuff. You know, we want people to be helped. And if you come to our website and you get direction, you know, like I said, I kind of knew what I want. But you come to our website, you get education and you kind of say, okay, this is for me and this not for me. Hey, this is not for me. This is great. That's great because what you've done is you've explored an option, you've eliminated, and hopefully you've learned something about what you do need. And that's our goal is we want you to walk away from that feeling like you've learned something. And if that's to choose to go into Mind Beacon, great. Okay, we can help you there. If that's to choose to go elsewhere, great, but you've gotten help. And that's what's important. Get help as soon as possible. There are two main streams, I guess, if you will, of the services. So there's the self-guided service, which is um, kind of a uh, more or less a real time, or I should say on your own time type of access to mental health services. And then there's also a um, more of a traditional service where you can book appointments and, and actually see um, a, a therapist that way. And um, so both are extremely useful. I think I think they kind of branch off of the initial idea behind um, Mind Beacon, which was a series of in-person clinics. And then you realize that at a certain point that like, yeah, there, there's, you know, you can only get so far by doing this, especially like you mentioned at the start, Northern communities, rural communities that don't have these specialists and don't have these clinics set up. So by digitalizing it, digitizing it, you can vastly scale access uh, to these types of therapies. I think one of the interesting things to me was that the the digital way of delivering cognitive behavioral therapy can be just as effective as the in-person. So that, that eliminates a huge barrier for anybody that has doubts or questions about whether or not that actually works. That That is the case. Both can be just as effective. Just one is way more convenient and way more accessible. For most people, that's true. Um, but, you know, a third of Canadians will talk to someone about their mental health. Two thirds don't want to talk to somebody, according to the Canadian Mental Health Commission. Oracle ran a study that they published in the Wall Street Journal that said that 82%, 82% of their people would rather talk to a chat bot, a bot about their mental health than a person. You know, this is this concept about it, as I said, do it your way. Okay, it's you do you, you need to weigh, weigh in how you want to do it. Our guided therapy, which is by the way, guided by regulated mental health care professional, a member of a professional college institution or regulatory body. Um, you get your own therapist, that therapist stays with you. So if you get Jane, Jane stays with you and she is your therapist throughout the whole thing. And you develop a very strong relationship with Jane, many people do, is that that eliminates a lot of barriers. Number one is this whole concept of scheduling appointments, times, et cetera. You do it literally, we're busy at midnight, Back in the days when people were getting on trains, we were busy when, uh, during commuting times and things like that. Um, and you don't have to worry about scheduling. And if you have a question about a concept that you're working through when we assign you stuff, then you, Jane will get back to you within a day. You don't have to wait for a week or two weeks your next appointment if you get confused as you're working. Because remember, cognitive behavioral therapy is a 
think of it as a, a training. Think of it as a sort of resiliency and training and skills building capability. All right. But having said that, lots of people want to talk to someone. Lots of people don't want to talk. They want to actually talk and see and look in someone's eyes like I'm looking in yours right now. And they want to understand. They want that person to understand what they're feeling. So we offer what we call our synchronous or real time services as well. So it's important to offer both. Now, the guided therapy has also has the advantage of really an equity and de democratizing it. It is one tenth to one fifth, one, one tenth to one uh, to one fifth the price, depending on how you do it. In Ontario, it's offered free to all Ontarians. You can just come on our website. The government pays for it. It is as effective for most cases, really severe cases, and things where we don't treat on the digital platform. For instance, we don't currently treat OC, uh, eating disorders on our platform. Schizophrenia isn't treated on our asynchronous platform. You'd have to go into into, into uh, real-time therapy for those. But things, but mood and anxiety disorders, depression, anxiety, panic, PTSD, you know, about eight to 10 other of those that we treat uh, as effective as in-person without the barriers. Again, the way, you, again, about accessibility, equity, availability, you do that by eliminating the barriers so people can get it. And that's what we've done. But like I said, some people want to actually talk to them. And by the way, some people don't even want to do either. Some people just want to, like, I'm feeling down. I want to just watch a video. I just want to, I just want to know what's bothering me. And I can do that on your Stronger Minds platform, which has no person, no interaction with a person. It's all, it's all a content feed. So, um, so again, it's, it's trying to make it kind of your way. And you mentioned there is something like, uh, I won't call you on this, uh, just in case uh, it might uh, be a different number, but something like 100,000 people have downloaded or have, uh, have uh, signed up and created an account on the platform. Um, is, that, uh, is that just um, on the platform itself, on, I guess, on the website? Or is there a no, larger we've had, number? We've, say? Had money, we've had many multiples of people come to our website. These are people that say, I'm actually going to create an account and start the journey. Okay. And, and so uh, this is after they would have done the edu done the question, like looked at the website and seen some of the questions and really thought about it. And uh, in terms of like, would that also encompass uh, programs that you set up through employer? That would be everybody. Yeah. That would be everybody. Okay. So um, again, for, for any of the, the audience that's uh, thinking about, about this sort of thing, um, there's already, uh, you know, at least a couple hundred thousand or at least a hundred thousand folks that have tried it um, and made use of this sort of thing. And so, you know, it's not uh, it's not something that's brand new and, you know, is going through a pilot or anything like that. This is quite a well-established program uh, available to a lot of different people. And the other piece that I wanted to emphasize also is that the, the therapist uh, that you have access to when you're going through the program, they're, uh, they're, they're registered and um, certified clinical therapists. And so this is, these are not, you know, kind of regular, I can no these don't these aren't these aren't what would be called coaches or gotcha. something like that these are you know for instance most of our people are registered uh, registered social workers most of the people on our platform although we do have registered psychologists and registered psychotherapists most of them are but they're all members anybody that's on the guided therapy platform is a member of a regulatory college so they are a regulated mental health care professional and that's important to us because we want people that understand and have been trained to help. Always good to uh, confirm on that point as well. Um, okay, so it, it again, it's really great to hear that uh, that this sort of thing is very accessible to people, right from you know their, their pockets. Really, if they think about it, if they have a cell phone, you can kind of carry this with you as you need to, uh, especially the self guided component. So, really awesome. This has been a long time coming. I think um, there's one thing that that COVID has really sort of taught us is the need to turn to the digital uh, technologies world um, to increase accessibility because, you know, as soon as in-person visits go down um, and there are restrictions around uh, how much time you can spend uh, out of your home, really, it becomes very difficult to do things like keep up with your appointments or to go and actually seek help. Um, I'm wondering what, what's been your experience at Mind Beacon? How, how has the pandemic shifted? I guess, usership, or maybe there's been a big boost in usership over the past year or so. Yeah, yeah, we've had a we've had a significant increase. And, and you talked about it up front, you know, COVID's done a number of things, the levels of anxiety, and depression and PTSD, 
you know, from people who've lost loved ones or people who have lost jobs or people who are lost just their ability to use their own coping me mechanism. Maybe someone's coping mechanism before was to go watch movies, to go to a movie or to do whatever. You know, people, we've all lost that, right? We've, we're all sort of stuck in our houses and sort of trying to help the healthcare system to continue to survive as we try to avoid, avoid the spread of the plague, uh, sorry, of the, of the pandemic. The um, COVID has clearly raised the levels of anxiety. Um, and, you know, listen, listen, we all mourn and pray for loved ones lost, uh, et cetera. But we shouldn't lose sight of the good that COVID has brought. I mean, there is good that has come out of COVID. The proverbial, you know, silver lining to the cloud, I think, is the same. But, you know, one of the, one of the good things about COVID is it has rapidly transformed and accelerated the adoption of virtual care in the healthcare system. And why is that important? Well, that's important, again, as you go back to accessibility and equity and fairness. It has made it so people, you know, think about the person that was working in a, in a factory, the person that's working on an hourly clock that's getting paid by the hour, the person at the grocery store. It's difficult for them to leave, to go, even if their employer covers the cost, you know, are they going to leave at two o'clock in the afternoon to get back at four o'clock after going to an appointment, even if there is a psychologist around? What COVID has done is it's rapidly transformed psychology to being delivered to a large degree virtually. Whether it's just regular synchronous care, which you would do in a clinic before you now do on a video like we're doing right now, or whether it's, it's really forced people to look hard at the, at the new technologies like our guided therapy that's as effective as you point out, as the, as the in-person therapy, it's really increased the accessibility and the availability and the acceptance of it. And so, you know, we say a lot about what COVID's done bad, but there's a ton that COVID has done good. And, you know, I applaud the governments around Canada who have, who have done it, whether it's, you know, the provincial government of Ontario making it, you know, really increasing their support for mental health. You know, that's a very good thing. People were suffering before COVID, they're suffering after, they're gonna suffer after COVID. You know, in fact, a study in the New York Times this weekend said it lasts for up to six years. Studies that we've done say it lasts, the real pandemic, the shadow, the echo pandemic doesn't hit for two or three years when people are back to what are, whatever normal becomes and they realize, well, normal wasn't what it was. And all of a sudden they realize all of the, the anxiety and stress they've gone through and then they need help. Like, you know, I think we're going to see an echo pandemic here. Uh, the data is pretty clear that we're going to see an echo pandemic. We can see parts of it now in the early, early stages. Um, but COVID has, in a good way, made mental health care accessible and available. It has democratized and forced democracy of it. Will people go back to in-person care? More, right, right now, we don't even offer in-person care. Our clinics are closed, according with health guidelines. Of course, we've kept our clinic closed. Our clinics will reopen. Do we expect some people to return? Yeah, we do. But we expect a lot of people to say, you know what? This is a faster, better, cheaper, easier lower barrier way for me to get effective mental health care. I'm sticking with this. Gosh, that's the, the point about uh, the echo that we're going to see when that happens, because it is a matter of, of when, um, I mean, we're not going to go back to a, the same normal. It, it will be a, a different normal. And um, uh, I, I love the fact that, again, like you were saying, a lot of these traditional services that had to be delivered only in person or could only be delivered in person are now being digitalized and, uh, and that's doing a lot of good to a lot of people. And I think the, the use of these services is only going to increase. I mean, it's, it's, it's just now starting to kind of ramp up because of the pandemic. Uh, but it's here to stay. I mean, the convenience alone is a big factor. Uh, cost reduction is a big factor. Uh, I mean, there's so many positives to it. Um, at, at the same time, I think one of the things that I've noticed in, in the mental health space alone, there are probably a few thousand you know, startups uh, that have uh, come out. So, and that's only in mental health. I mean, across the board, all, <laughs> all, um, all therapy areas have had their own, you know, apps and, and platforms and so on. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. And on that point as well. So Mind Beacon recently went through uh, a public uh, IPO, I believe in December and uh, quite successful. So I wanted to, to congratulate you guys for that. Um, I think it also mirrors the demand and the interest in expanding mental services um, and, and the historic need for it. And it wasn't up until now recently that something that, that you know somebody could do something about it on a very big scale, uh, which is what 
you guys and uh, other uh, platforms as well have been able to accomplish. I'm wondering with the um, with the raise uh, now that it's a public company, you know what what's next for for Mind Beacon? Are you looking to expand services, add complementary services, uh, maybe expand to other regions? What are you hoping to accomplish? Oh, you know, yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, you know, what, what this gives us, the, what, what the public offering has done, and, and I'm very pleased by the reception we got, which is a recognition, you know, we got in this business as, you know, as to solve a social problem, Claire and I did, we made it a real business because as opposed to a not-for-profit because we thought it had to be sustainable and, and we wanted to create a sustainable long-term solution to this mental health care problem. And Claire really pushed that hard uh, from the very beginning is that this has allowed us now to, uh, you know, to, to build our, ca our capabilities even greater. You know, we have, I, I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens of people we've hired since we officially went public on December 23rd. You know, we're hiring more data scientists, we're hiring more psychologists, find more people that can actually make our products better and can also make the products less expensive to the public and drive efficiencies into the, into the system. It allows us to expand you know, it'll allow us to go into hard to reach communities as well. You know, our, our system today is written for middle Canada. Okay. You know, this allows us to really focus on specific groups that have largely been underserved today and will allow us to really adjust our system to be more culturally appropriate in many cases, you know, and so we're super excited about what's doing the product. It'll also allow us to take a Canadian success story and take it across the world and to show the world what Canada is about. And we are in the process of doing that. We're hiring outside of Canada right now to help expand our services south of the border and uh, overseas. And we're looking forward to showing that and taking it. And in the same time, we're, like I said, we're creating lots of jobs across Canada to do that. And so we're kind of proud of that. You know, to be honest with you, we're proud to be an, a growing employer, especially in a time when, you know, lots of people have lost their jobs. We're proud to be actually expanding. And, uh, you know, that's, that's important for us. You know, when I was the visiting economist in the Federal Department of Finance, I helped to, to build uh, and to think about how to rethink and reimagine the, the venture capital industry uh, under Minister Thier Flaherty, uh, the late Minister Flaherty. And, uh, you know, we took some pride in some building that. And, and like we're taking pride across all of our 300 plus employees take quite a bit of pride that we are helping out at a time when help's needed. Like you said, there is a bit of a silver lining here. Uh, and, and again, with um, a lot of long-term positive benefits. So I think there is a quite a bit of a win-win for, for a lot of folks out there. Um, there's one, one last question. I mean, I'd love to, to continue this conversation for a couple more hours, but unfortunately we, we have uh, uh, other things to get to today. Uh, the part about uh, data and how it might be used to, to do research um, that, let's say, even further enhances uh, accessibility and so on uh, to CBT and other, other types of services. How, how is that incorporated into the Mind Beacon sort of approach or, or you know, strategy, if you will? Um, and then complementary to that, um, are there steps, uh, guidelines, and, and so on that you're also taking on to ensure that there's, you know, uh, not transparency, that's not the right word, but uh, ensure data privacy and security so that you can maintain that positive relationship with uh, with users so they can stay on the platform. Oh, yeah. No, no. When you said trans, just the in data privacy and security, we think of it just the opposite. We <laughs> yeah. think of lack of transparency. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time and we use we use external consultants to make sure we're up to speed and we're, and we're doing the best we can and and on that and we're full fully SOC 2 compliant now we're HIPAA and PPTA compliant we're going to we're working towards our European standard compliancy as well. Um, the new standard that will come out in Canada, we fully intend to be fully compliant with with that as well. So <clears throat> data security and data privacy rather legislation and security is super important to us. Um, safety first. Um, and that's part of safety. It's also part of breaking down the barrier because again, the barrier is, you know, for instance, a lot of people wouldn't submit a bill to their um, insurance company uh, for, you know, in our clinic business, when we had a clinic, when we had a clinic business prior to COVID and get reimbursed because they thought maybe their employer was seeing it. And that was feedback we got regularly as well. My employer is going to track this spend and therefore, you know, that's why, you know, making it private and safe so no one knows you do it when, where, how you want 
If you want to tell your story like I chose to tell my story publicly, that's your call. No one else's call. Okay, and you can do that. We're not going to do that, but you can do that. And so we want to make sure it's safe and, and, and private. But the data thing is something that, that is, uh, you know, a little bit in the geek. I'm super interested and, 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 and really kind of excited about because, you know, for the first time, we're collecting um, anonymized always, separate, separately collected, but we're able to take data and on large tens of thousands of, of interactions with our platform and see patterns and see ways in which, you know, if you reacted this way during your assessment and you answered this questions this way, then this tend to be your outcome. So if we got that outcome on that set of facts, how do we take that instead of getting you a 60% symptom reduction, get you an 80% symptom reduction? What do we need to do differently in our treatment? How do we need to improve what we do? Or how can we suggest other things you may want to consider that make your treatment better? And, and I want to be on your program for all of your listeners to so be super clear. It's all completely anonymized. Mm -hmm. It's completely blind to us. But you actually have that data now that, you know, in, and if you can make it better, if I can get symptom reduction higher, I can also drive the cost down. And when you drive the cost down, what do you do? You make it more accessible to people. Why? Because it costs less to you. The price is less. The cost is less. Thus, you make it more accessible. And, and again, you know, we want to make mental health care available, affordable, and accessible to everyone. It also allows us, you know, we have, I'm proud to say, we did a study, we have um, 107 different countries of origin on our platform. Now, these are Canadians because we're only like, we're only regulated professors right now, Canadians, but one of the great strengths of our country is our, our, is our diversity. And we have tracked by self-reported, of course, um, 107 different countries of origin. We have this beautiful treasure trove of, how it works from different countries of origin and, and then how can we make things more appropriate? Now I'm speaking futuristic because right now, again, we build a basic, we built the system. The system is, is the system right now. We use data analysis and data learning obviously to make it better. But in the future, what is already a very tailored experience, Dorian, so when you come on our platform and you start our depression and you decide you have, like Pete, you, it looks like you're having some panic, fire outcome in our measurement, we're fanatic about measuring outcomes. Then, you know, next time you come on, there'll be information on panic. If you say I have to return to work, next time you come on, there'll be return to work content. Like it's already a personalized experience. But we think that by using data science, we can make this thing a truly one-to-one -one experience. You can get your unique for what you need available when you need it and when you're ready to consume it uh, at, your, at your decision. And so that's what that's what we're so excited about, the, the data. We just We just think it's going to be... We think we've already, you know, we're in the early, early, early innings of mental health revolution. And, and we think that uh, we're excited about the future. That's great to hear. Um, I, you know, as somebody who comes from a data science background, who's used uh, big data sets to, you know, measure outcomes for clinical research purposes, um, I know the value that kind of information can provide towards improving services. Um, so, you know, I look forward to, to seeing some interesting work uh, come out of that work, that, that uh, that data, uh, if possible, if you guys are looking to do things like uh, publish white papers and so on. Uh, but in any case, I know it's going to be used um, to improve services, and that, that's extremely important in and of itself. Um, all right, Sam, it's been uh, it's been a wonderful uh, time. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to to join us and uh, to answer some of these questions about the work going on at Mind Beacon and how it's expanding access to mental health services uh, to Canadians. Um, I, I hope we get a chance to have another conversation uh, over the next uh, few months as more things happen and as the company grows. And, uh, you know, I look forward to, to having you come back on. Well, thank you for your time. I look forward to spending more time with you and I really appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate the time you've given me. Thanks so I'm much. Grateful. Have Take a great care. one, Sam. Bye-bye. Take care.